Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the program. Great to be with you once again on Let's Talk. This is ITV Networks. And as always, we have a whole host of interesting guests talking about interesting issues and the kind of stuff that touches their lives in a very positive way. Today, we'll start off by talking about coffee, coffee shops, um, good food and uh, good ambiance. And the people to talk to us about this amazing concept is Carve Road Cafe. They're based in the Western Cape. Pity they're not here in Johannesburg yet. We're hoping that they will be making a grand entrance into our part of the world. But I understand that they're doing some interesting things out in the Western Cape. So let's talk to the two guys involved. It's written Ram Lal and Ernest Andrews. Good morning, guys. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Now, I do right at the outset have to say to you that we have another program that is out here on a regular basis. It's called iTrend. And the presenter of that show really pulls out all the stops when she talks to cafe owners and coffee shops, etc. Mm -hmm. They come in with an amazing spread. And after the show is over, we all have a grand party. So where's the spread? <laughs> We're going to have a party afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> OK, whenever we talk food, it's always nice to to have the actual stuff here or mm -hmm. pictures of the type of food you serve and of course the type of drinks and when we talk drinks we're obviously talking coffees mm -hmm. and um, the fruit juices etc but before we get into the food stuff all the stuff that's going to make us really hungry this morning <laughs> on the show let's talk about the two of you how did this collaboration happen why should we become excited about Carve Road Cafe based in the Western Cape. So, Ritten, you sound like a Durban, um, you, you, you sound like a guy out of Durban. Tell us the story. Uh, exactly. I grew up in Durban. Uh, I moved to Johannesburg uh, uh, early in the 2000s. But you come from a financial background. I do. So I was involved in business all my life uh, on the trading floor, actually. So I traded for 13 years. Wow. Uh, so obviously the coffee, a journey in my life is something new and exciting, but it is very much passion driven. Um, you know, always loved coffee, always loved travel, always loved journey. And, and good food. Exactly, uh, exactly. So, you know, I did own restaurants before starting the Carve Road brand. Um, the Carve Road brand really started about two years ago when I think myself and, and my group of you know founding partners uh, wanted to disrupt the coffee industry. Coffee had been going through this, uh, what we call a global revolution. Um, and you and it's definitely here to stay. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost this artisanal movement towards a more sophisticated product, a more premium product. People want to know things about how the perfect cup of coffee reached uh, their table, you know, what's involved in the whole process, the quality of beans. It's really a culinary and gastronomic movement right. uh, globally. I'm going to leave the coffee part to Ernest of because course. I know he's the connoisseur, if that is the right word to use. Let's uh, focus on the other elements mm -hmm. of uh, Carve Road Cafe. I also know that you call yourselves proudly South African. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, I think first and foremost, this brand is born in South Africa, right? Um, we, uh, we use local artisans, uh, you know, whilst we will import the best coffee beans around the world, uh, from around the world, which is what Ernest will talk about. Every other aspect of our business and brand is developed in South Africa. We also develop this brand to embrace all South Africans, which is why we, you know, make sure we are Probably South African certified. Why we and halal, cer halal certified? Uh, well, Alhamdulillah for that. Thank you. Why, why we are halal certified? And it's it's about to pay respect and to embrace all South Africans, but also all global citizens. Uh, so you want to be way. sure nobody is excluded from this amazing experience. Exactly. Let's just understand the shift from a financial background mm. into the food industry. 
that must have been quite a leap of faith for you. I mean, here you had this job, you've been in it for 13 years, you know that you're going to get uh, your salary at the end of the mm -hmm. month. Starting up a business, and very especially a food business, is very different. Lots of risks involved. No, definitely. Uh, and it's, it's what every entrepreneur will face, uh, whether you're in this country or other countries. Uh, there's various challenges that are specific to South Africa. But definitely, you know, you need quite a bit of bravery um, to start a journey like this. Um, the most important and most difficult is the first step that you take, uh, you know, and knowing exactly what you want to do, having the right vision and knowing where you fit in. So I keep on telling, uh, you know, my partners and stuff, the world didn't need another coffee shop nor co another <laughs> coffee brand. So we at Carver Road needed to know exactly what we wanted to change in the coffee industry and how we we're going to do it. And um, in addition to the world's finest coffees that we offer, um, we have a beautiful central kitchen in Woodstock that produces all our food. Uh, we do business supplies from there. We do online supplies from there. And we all also do catering from there as well. Um, a very exciting step that we launched uh, late last year is uh, the introduction of our coffee capsules that, that are Nespresso uh, compatible. So it's about taking that perfect... So we could mm. use those capsules in our Nespresso machines it, without a problem. Exactly. They're 100% Okay, perfect. We're going to... I'm sure there were lots of sleepless nights involved there. Lots. There is still some. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think we've, we've gone from the early stages where you know, you're fighting for survival to now uh, there's nice problems. So, you know, we are definitely in the growth stage of the brand. Uh, we're looking to grow nationally and internationally. Uh, but it's it's a challenging space. There's two and a half billion cups of coffee drunk every day around the world. South Africa is no, no different. There's lots of different coffee brands. But we are very confident about what we stand for in a company and a brand. And, uh, you know, even in naming our brand Carve Road, there was a specific reason for that. We'll come back to that reason after the ad break. I'm talking to Ritan Ramlal and Ernest Andrews. They are obviously involved with Carve Road Cafe and they're based in the Western Cape. Pity they're not here yet, but they have assured me that they've brought a whole host of capsules for us here to the studio. And the good news is that we have a coffee machine in the studio. So I'm going to have a taste of the coffee after the show. And I will obviously give you feedback on that as well. Let's go for our first ad break. When we get back, we're going to be talking to Ernest. He is the coffee connoisseur at Carve Road Cafe. And we're talking my favorite passion, and that is coffees. We're talking Carve Road Cafe. They're based in the Western Cape. And two of uh, the uh, representatives, I think part owners, they'll tell us what exactly their roles are at the cafe. But the second guest we're going to talk from Carve Road Cafe is Ernest Andrews. He is the coffee connoisseur. Morning. Lovely to talk to you. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Your journey, your love and your passion for coffee, when and how did it start? So probably about 10 years ago, I was actually studying to be a commercial helicopter pilot. Oh, goodness me. Did you get your license? Yes, I'm, so I'm qualified. Okay. Um, and uh, between that, um, I started uh, some part-time work uh, in the cafe in Durban. And kind of the love started there um, of understanding that this very simple product that everybody thinks it is, is um, so diverse in flavor and in expression. And Just takes you to another that's world. It. Yes, <laughs> it's, uh, um, the passion started with understanding that how you manipulate a, a simple bean into a experience. Um, and that's what we at Carver Road was trying to embrace in the South African communities. Get people to understand that coffee is a, a beautiful premium product that we as a conversation starter. And uh, that was the idea from the beginning when I started was to get people to understand the passion about this product and understanding flavors. Now, I've read of other coffee connoisseurs and they talk about their journeys all around mm. the world, yes. finding the perfect coffee bean or grown under very specific and special conditions yes. to get maximum flavor. Um, so you hear all of these amazing stories and how they try and blend them with all the different flavors like you chocolate, you get caramel, you get toffee, uh, and the list goes on. Yes. So what is it that you started doing 
to bring a very unique taste, sensation and experience to Carve Road. So you're definitely right. I mean, there's a whole different host of environments, altitude, um, which part of the country in the globe coffee grows. And um, what we do is we use 100% Arabica coffee, which is uh, one of the most flavor, flavorful varietals. And um, what we do at Carve Road is we try to give people a unique flavor experience where if I tell you you can taste milk chocolates and uh, caramelized berries, you can definitely taste it. You don't have to be a connoisseur to, to find those flavors. So I've put a lot of work in into trying to find these uh, coffee varietals from different places and we've put them together in um, our house blend called Petra, um, which is that beautiful milk chocolate, caramelized berries. And we want our, our customers, when they take a sip, to pick those flavors up instantly. Now, you guys have been in operation for just over a year and of course, written tells us that things are going great. What sort of feedback do you get from your customers in terms of your unique brand and unique flavors of coffee? And we know Carve Road is not only about coffee, but it seems you're both talking a lot about coffee, that mm. that is the main element and the main attraction at mm -hmm. your uh, cafe. Um, there are other food stuff that you do serve, uh, pastries, cake, um, Sami's, uh, sliders, and the list goes on. Um, but let's talk about feedback from your regular customers. So we, uh, our amazing team in, in Woodstock, um, the chefs there, um, and ourselves from the, on the coffee side, from the business side, we kind of want to give somebody experience when they walk into our cafe. Um, we want them to have an understanding that if you have a coffee, the coffee is um, complemented by the food and vice versa. So most of our clients are always um, so surprised and how um, fine-tuned all our products are at the store. So we've, uh, like Ritin said before, we've catered all our products for proudly South African um, people and we haven't taken a international trend and brought it to South Africa, we've created our own trend in South Africa. So I'm hearing that the long-term plan is that you're going to take Carvero Cafe not only nationally but mm -hmm. internationally because you are talking about proudly South African and that's great to hear and what I'm also getting is that this is a great um, entrepreneurship uh, opportunity not only you guys have started it but for other young people watching us this morning in two minutes to wrap up what can you tell me about that statement that I've just made to you definitely so as I mentioned you know 2018 is definitely going to be the year of, of growth for the for the brand um, we uh, definitely want to be uh, international and we are primed for that in terms of our concept. I mentioned we've just launched our Nespresso compatible capsules and for us that is a key differentiator for, from so, other coffee so brands. So I can go into a supermarket and get the Carve Road uh, coffees in capsules or what is it, uh, what's the brand name for it? It's Carve Road capsules. Oh, there uh, you we're go. not in supermarkets yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully this year we will be in some uh, select uh, supermarkets. We are online so we already supplying nationally to uh, you know many of our fans um, and it really is a special product so we've gone back to the source on you know getting the best beans roasting it the right way grinding it the right doing way, doing it all yourselves blending it doing it all ourselves mm -hmm. um, who's, the, who's the coffee taster do you have several coffee tasters um, on board? We've, we've, I mean, we've got a, we've got a decent team. Obviously, myself, but and Ernest will, Ernest spearheads all the product development. Uh, okay, that's where we have to leave it. Can't wait to chat with you guys again the next time you're in our part of the country. Please pop in and let's get an update of what exactly is happening at Carve Road Cafe. We're going to look out for you guys and look out for your store opening in Johannesburg. Thank you so much for being with me. Thanks very much. Yes. The guys from Carve Road Cafe and of course I'm now really wanting a cup of coffee very desperately. They've just got the taste buds going and can't wait to get my hands on that coffee. Let's go for our next ad break. Okay, from discussions around coffee, we're also going to be talking water and the water crisis not only in South Africa, but globally. Professor Anthony Turton from the University of the Free State will be here to talk to us about perhaps 
possible solutions as far as the water crisis is concerned. But let's go to something rather sublime and that is beauty, the beauty of jewelry and just how that can lift your spirits. My next guest is studying psychology but her outlet is in designing and selling jewelry. Her name is Zahra Surti and she's in studio with us with some pieces of her work, artwork shall I say. And if you call into the show, well rather not call in, you need to drop us an email. You can drop us an email at let's talk at ITV Networks and if we like your answer you can just make a comment about anything on Let's Talk and if we like what you're saying you'll walk away with one of these prizes and the camera is now going to give us a wide shot of the jewelry we have in, on display and then we'll chat with the creator of the jewelry and that is the lovely Zahra Surti. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam and jazakallah for having me on your show. Lovely to have you here and I'm just looking at these gorgeous pieces that you have created and commend you for your artistry. This is truly a work of art, is it not? It's gorgeous. I mean, this piece, for example, is so colorful and it's so bold, which is exactly what my brand represents. It's about bold women. It's about fierce women. It's about women who are not afraid to really be themselves. And each item should represent something bold in a woman. Okay, so you are Zahra Surti, yes, you are doing your masters yes, in psychology, in psychology. And, um, but somewhere along the way, somewhere along uh, your years at university, you felt that there was something inside of you that needed to let this creative juices start flowing. What mm -hmm. was going on in your mind? That's exactly it. So I mean, I've always been interested in fashion from the time I was a young kid. Um, I've also always loved psychology, but I didn't really know how to merge the two together. It came to a point in my life where I was so overwhelmed with the fashion industry and how we focus so much on external beauty that we don't focus on how pieces essentially make us feel as women. And that's when I decided to start Be Bold. I said it's a brand which every single time you look at this piece, you know that it represents something in you that you want to be reminded of. And so it's really a brand about merging inner beauty with outer beauty. And for me, that was merging psychology with fashion. Okay, so you talk about your brand which is called Be Bold and it's an online brand. Yes. You also talk about pieces, how the individual pieces of jewellery make you feel. Mm -hmm. Are you then, is this all handmade? No, so all of my pieces are handpicked. They are all imported, but we take lots of care to, I mean, choose them, make sure that the quality is good, make sure that the items that we're actually providing to our customers is a valuable item. Do you then, so I'm assuming your uh, supplier is based somewhere overseas? Yes, yes, absolutely. Right. What sort of brief do you give to your supplier? And do you send pictures, drawings, etc.? Mm -hmm. I was under the impression that you created these yourself. You handmade them, no? No, so everything is imported, but they based on what the needs are of the fashion industry. So I first consult my clientele and I ask them, what would you like from Be Bold? You know, what pieces would, re would really make you feel more beautiful as a woman? And they often come back and they say, really colorful pieces, because I can't really find that anywhere. I feel like we either stuck between really, really simple or really, really extreme. And there's nothing in between which we can wear every single day. So when I'm sourcing all of my pieces, I look for quality. Um, I look at what are the needs of the fashion industry. Um, I look at whether it actually fits the Be Bold brand as well. And all of those three concepts merge together then right. allows me. You say you look for quality and I'm wondering how many pieces of a particular style do you bring into the country? Because obviously this is a very, very bold piece. Mm -hmm. It stands out, it makes quite an impression. But if I purchase this piece, I would hate to see every second person in the street or the community yes. wearing the same piece. Absolutely. So our, our quantity is very limited. I only buy a maximum about seven or eight pieces. And as soon as of I the buy same time. of the same style, and as soon as I purchase a certain style and it's available for customers to purchase off our site they get notified new stock is in do have a look and often it gets sold out quite fast because people want things that are different people want things that are quite unique and bold mm -hmm. You also spoke about quality. Mm -hmm. Now, you also, I presume, you also buy offline. 
Yes. You, that's the way you deal with your supplier. How can you ascertain that the quality is um, reliable? Because you you buy you you buying from a picture. Mm -hmm. You buying blind. Mm -hmm. What happens if the stock arrives? Um, do you first see it and inspect it before you put it online? Yeah, so quality It doesn't checks. get supplied directly from the supplier to the customer? No, no it doesn't. It passes through me first. I do a few quality checks. I sometimes wear the piece myself and I ascertain for myself, is it a good piece? Is this a piece that's really value for money? And from there onwards, I say, you know what, this is a really reliable piece. Um, this is a piece that will last you for a very long time. But I mean, quite a lot of research goes into it as well. Before you find suppliers, before you uh, build a brand, you need to know um, am so I what offering? sort of research are you talking about? It's research into what exactly your clientele requires, number one. Uh, what are the needs of the fashion industry? When it comes to online businesses, we are often so hesitant to buy online because we don't know what we're going to buy. So it takes quite some time to build a trusting relationship with your clientele. But I mean, um, if you allow clientele to come in, see the pieces themselves. Like we also attend a lot of pop-up events. So oftentimes people come and they want to feel the item. They want to make sure that it actually looks good. And we are completely okay with that because we feel like if you are buying something, you, you have to be 100% happy with it. Okay, I'm talking to Zahra Surti and I'd just like to get a wide angle of the jewellery on display here and also to point out to you that this very colourful piece here is the one that Zahra has very kindly decided to give away on the show this morning. So what you need to do is to drop us an email at Let's Talk at ITV Networks and just tell us a little bit about the program. What is it that you like about Let's Talk and perhaps what is it that you don't like about Let's Talk? And if you and if we believe that we like your answer, if your answer talks to us, then this is the piece of jewelry that is going to be sent off to you. So please get those uh, fingers um, on the keyboard and send us your responses. Now, Zahra, you um, talk about your pieces. What about designing your own pieces? Do you actually design something, send it off to the suppliers, ask them to give you a costing, get that sample back, and then you obviously touch, see, feel, mm -hmm. and it, 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 it's been manufactured exactly to your brief. Is that when you place the order? Yes, yeah, so it's actually quite a long process. Um, we are in the process of sending off designs to suppliers. And that's oh, that based, hasn't happened yet. No, that hasn't happened yet. But that's something that we're really looking into into the near future because a lot of customers want very sentimental pieces For they example, want to design themselves yes they mm. want pieces that speak to who they really are mm. you know a lot of people like those charm bracelets yes. which is something that we're also looking into um, in those circumstances yes we do design them ourselves and then we send them off to our suppliers they then send us back a sample we evaluate that do a quality check and from there onwards we ascertain is this good enough does this fit with our brand Okay, so for how long have you been in business? Uh, so it's been about two years. I started it at the end of 2015. So this is going into my third year of it. How is it going? It's in terms of sales, do you find a situation where, for example, you've ordered 10 or 20 pieces of a certain item and for some reason it just ain't moving? You know, there definitely are circumstances like that. There are lots of risks when it comes to fashion. Fashion is so dynamic and ever-changing that what may be in fashion today may not be in fashion tomorrow. So it's always a risk when you... Um, a seller of a certain item but I mean oftentimes things that don't get sold what one person may not like another person may absolutely love and I think that's what Be Bold is about it's about suiting the needs of so many different kinds of women it's not just about one woman it's about every woman out there who just wants to feel so much more beautiful with the jewelry that she wears and I guess when there is a situation where you're sitting with a couple of pieces that ain't selling um, you will find means and ways of um, trying to sell it off because there's, the risk here is you having to pay upfront for all of the pieces mm -hmm. that you import. So it's an outlay on your part and you need to obviously make sure that you get back what you've outlaid. Yes. And of course, you're in it 
not only for the beauty but for the profit as well of course of course absolutely. it's a business absolutely um, this business has taught me so much about marketing it's taught me about the fashion needs and it's taught me about um, really meeting the expectations of people um, our pop-up events do really, really well. There are so many women who come just for our stall because they want to feel the jewelry and see how it looks on them. And um, those pop-up events have really been worth our while. And from there onwards, we then market our online platform. And people know that who they're buying from is not just a random person behind a screen, but they actually know you and you develop quite a relationship with that person. Now, talk to us about the few pieces we have here. This is a stunning piece, as is every piece here. And I'm thinking pricing. Obviously, you may have a very beautiful piece of jewelry, mm -hmm. but if the price is not right, you're not going to sell. And you've had to take your you've had to work that into the equation as well. Yes. Uh, so talk to us about pricing and also if I buy online um, and I place my order today, when will I get uh, delivery mm -hmm. of my uh, purchase? Yes. Um, so our items are very reasonably priced because we believe that you shouldn't pay exorbitant prices for something that should be an everyday wearing item. So for example, this piece, which is really colorful and goes with, you can wear it with plain black, you can wear it with a solid color, for example, the cerise pink or this green. This is really a versatile piece. This year would retail for about 220 rands. Um, then, for example, and of course, would what about postage, etc. Post oh, insurance. Yes. So we so we courier it directly to your door. Uh, that is dependent on where you stay. So you pay an uh, an additional fee for that. The Johannesburg region will be about fifty rands, whereas out of Johannesburg will be about seventy rands. And we also find a very well well we have a very trusted um, courier company. So we know that the item that we're sending you will actually arrive to you in the same condition as when we sent it. Okay, talk to us about the earrings and the gold and silver piece there. Okay, so earrings are really in fashion at the moment, especially tassel earrings. And if you have a look at this, this is plain black, but it's really, really classy and really elegant. Um, something like this would retail for about 180 rands. And um, this is a piece that so many women have come back to me and said, I can wear this every single day or I can wear it to a function. And people like pieces which they can chop and change outfits with. And this is that piece. And that necklace over there. Okay, this necklace here, it's really like a leaf design, which a lot of women have taken to because it blends simplicity with also something that's very unique. Um, gold is also a very versatile color. And this looks very nice on the mannequin against black or against white. Uh, these two pieces have been the most popular pieces in my collection. I've had lots of people come back to me and say, you know what, so many people have asked me about this piece. I've had so many people who I've referred your website to simply because they've never seen items like this before. Okay, up to now, from the time of startup, how many pieces have you sold? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I mean, it's been quite a bit. Mm -hmm. We go from collection to collection. There's the tropical collection, which this piece forms a part of. And then you have um, more simplistic collections. And then we have more workwear collections. So it's really across a wide range of different collections that we sell items of. So in closing then, to give Be Bold a big, big punt on the show this morning, why should we buy from you and what's going to be different and unique as far as our experience with Be Bold would be? Okay, so we've, we really value service delivery and customer satisfaction. Above and beyond that, Be Bold is about merging outer beauty with inner beauty. It's about what this piece represents in you that you want to be proud of. And like that, it's not just looking at the fashion industry at a glance, but it's really using the fashion industry to enhance who you already are as a woman. And I think that's why people should buy from Be Bold. I'm thinking all of these pieces here, apart from the earrings, is women that uh, wear um, hijab and obviously wear abayas. This would look very good on, that, uh, on them as well, wouldn't it? It would really Absolutely. be standout pieces. But on that note, then, thank you for being with us. Lots of success for your ongoing business and the merging of your psychology practice and jewelry, enhancing that and enhancing the power of women. Thank you for being with us.
with us. And a reminder to our listeners, our, our viewers, is if you send us an email to Let's Talk at ITV Networks with a comment, then perhaps you can walk away with this gorgeous piece of jewellery that has been um, obviously um, imported by uh, Zahra Surti from Be Bold. It's an online business and she is extremely passionate about jewellery and making women look beautiful to be bold and beautiful. Time for an ad break. Thank you. Welcome back from coffee to online jewellery to the water crisis in Cape Town and of course globally because it's not only Cape Town that is sitting in the grips of a water crisis. We know this is an issue all around the world. So in studio this morning we have Professor Anthony Turton. He lectures in environmental studies at the University of the Free State. He is an author, he dabbles in poetry and he can trace his family roots right back to uh, the 1500s. An amazingly interesting man. His CV runs for pages and pages and pages. And it gives me a great pleasure to have him in the studio this morning. He has been on the show last year sometime talking about the water issues locally and globally and we have him once again in studio to talk about the imminent day zero in Cape Town. Professor Turton, morning, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Lovely to have you here and we're going to talk some very serious stuff this morning. We're talking water crisis not only in South Africa but all around the world but let's start off by asking the all-important question. We hear day zero being bandied about and the goalposts being pushed uh, further and further out. Um, it was April, then May, then June, and now we're hearing it's July. Is that in fact true or is it just a scare tactic for the people in the Western Cape? I don't think that day zero is a scare tactic. I think it would be incorrect to call it that. Whether day zero is going to be a specific moment in time is a debatable question. Unfortunately, the concept is contested. Uh, it's part of the political contestation between two political parties at the moment and uh, the one party says it's going to happen, the other party says it isn't going to happen and that confuses people further. I think the important thing about the concept of day zero is that a moment in time is upon us whereby the, the, the security of supply to a city, it can no longer be guaranteed. So whether it will be one particular day at one moment in time, we cannot say, but day zero is absolutely upon us uh, in South Africa, not only in Cape Town, in other parts of the country as well. As an environmentalist, you obviously um, lecture in environment mm. studies at the University of yeah. the Free State. We're talking water crisis, but it's much bigger than that. It's food sustainability as well. It's food security and way, way bigger than that. Uh, so the implications of day zero looming and possibly happening, coming and catching us unexpectedly, um, is going to have huge implications. Yes, yeah, if I had to criticise the concept of day zero, it's because all they are focusing on is drinking water. They're completely blind to the fact that the important water is not so much drinking water. The important water is the water to sustain the economy. A human being can survive on a litre of water a day. You can live a, an uncomfortable but reasonable life on 50 litres per, per day. That's what day zero is Which about. Which is doable, obviously. It's doable, but it's uncomfortable. Right. But uh, you can live a, a good quality life on 250 litres of water per person per day. But water for food and water for the economy is big water. A typical person will eat around about 3,000 calories of food per day. And, and a, a ballpark number is that for every calorie of food, there's about a water, a, a litre of water involved. So a typical uh, diet of 3,000 calories per day means 3,000 litres, three tonnes of water has been used somewhere else in order to produce that food. So from this we can distill out the fact that, let's call it three different aspects of water. The first is the water for survival. And that is a relatively small amount of water and that can be quite easily managed. The second amount is the water for economic employment, uh, the water needed for the economy to keep going, for the banks to stay open, for people don't think about water and banking, etc. But these are very important things, okay? Then the third component is water for food. 
And if you later on get into the whole war to war conversation, you'll find out actually how these three things play out into that very complicated discourse. I don't want to preempt your questions, but, but, <laughs> but if, if we should go in that direction, yes. I, you know, I just need you to Time understand. I need you to understand that, that there's, there's, there's water for survival, small water, water for living a reasonable quality life, sort of let's call it medium water, water for the economy. And the water for the economy can be broken down into water for gainful employment of people and then water for the production of food. And this is what we're not seeing. We're only seeing the water mm. for survival, the water for human consumption, as mm. in my home, as in the 50 litres that I'm allowed today. We're not seeing the bigger picture. Absolutely. And it is dire. It is dire, and in fact, uh, where, what I would suggest we are seeing playing out now in the Western Cape is the limitation to the paradigm of water resource management that we've had over the last 200 years. And that is the paradigm of scarcity. We, we always hear the, the, the word said that South Africa is the 30th driest country in the world. Now, I don't know if anyone has ever actually measured that, but that's something that just gets, <laughs> just gets, gets repeated as if it's right. a fact. But because of the paradigm of scarcity, how you define a problem in the scientific world also determines how you solve the problem. So the way you define a problem is not necessarily neutral. So we've defined the problem up to now as a scarcity of water. So we are managing scarcity and, and therefore we need to do a number of things. And one of the things we've done is we have chased as much water, we've trapped and stored as much water as we can on the surface through, through dams. But you also talk about the uh, future of dams is now all, almost obsolete. Exactly, because we're reaching the end of this paradigm of scarcity. And, and the, the end game of the paradigm of scarcity is that water is so scarce that we can only keep people alive, but we can't employ them. So we can't have a quality of life. And when you start getting to this, to this sort of water and social instability conversation, it now comes down to the fact that people, because they are unable to, uh, to, to support themselves, are now forced to do other things in order to put food on the table. And I'll give you an example. About a month or two ago, somebody reported on Facebook a very strange thing. They said that uh, we know there's a lot of crime in, in South Africa, and uh, they used to having their houses broken into. But what they found in this case was someone broke into a big uh, complex, uh, a, a group of people broke in, and they didn't steal anything. It appears that they broke in to have a shower. Oh my word! See, so yeah, you started. So to the see crime them. scenario is changing as well. The, the crime scenario. So the, the, these are subtle things that, because our cognitive framework. Uh, uh, is not sensitive to these issues. But it's also telling us the value of water. Yes. It's now a very valuable component or a very valuable resource. It always has been. We just didn't see it that way. Well, you now you mentioned some very interesting things there because if you're talking about the value of water, there's different values. There's a cultural value, there's a religious value, there's a social value, there's an economic value. There are different values for water. And what we see happening now in the Western Cape as a result of day zero is the emergence of almost a fear of the privatization of water. The fear that water has been commodified and therefore privatized and therefore it's going to become expensive. But isn't that perhaps the route to go? Well, uh, we get into a complex conversation now because if water is scarce, something that is scarce in and of itself will have value. True. So how do Prices we value? Will go through the roof. Well, we don't only value things in terms of, of, of monetary value. See, so we can we can give a spiritual value to water. Now that's that's a, that's a certain thing that's very important. But but at some point in time we've got to come up to this very awkward conversation in South Africa because we've run our water management paradigm as the paradigm of scarcity. We have to overcome scarcity by trapping every last drop. We, the next conversation we have to start having now is how do we value water? Because once you start talking about how you value water, you now start enabling other things that need to happen if we're going to get out of this paradigm of scarcity into what I call the paradigm of abundance. Okay, I want to talk about how we go about the concept. Let's get our mind round about how you value water. But I also want to look at virtual water, green water yes. and blue water, which you talk about. Yes. And then I want to talk about your family history, the, uh, you know, going right back to the uh, 1500s, yes. how that plays into all of this and who you are as a person. <laughs> so let's unpack the issue around the value of water. How does, you know, are we going to wait for people in authority, powers of authority that's going to do this for us? Uh, how, 
do we become responsible and key players in this scenario as well? Yes, that's a lot of questions that you asked there, and I hope I can do justice to some of those questions. How we value water is going to be a very important thing going forward. Now, because water is a political thing, water is highly politicized, we're going to have to have a political conversation about this at some point in time. And in South Africa, we've got this big issue right now about uh, is our economy going to be state-centric or is it going to be private sector driven? Now, the, the free market model versus, versus the, 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 the developmental state. That's a huge conversation. And within that conversation, we've the whole issue of water. Now, I would argue that because water has been nationalized, because it has become something that's, that doesn't have economic value, we've now reached the point where we don't have any more of it left because we, we are not we're not uh, uh, capitalizing the, uh, the, 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 the equipment and machinery and pipes and pumps and infrastructure needed to give us a guaranteed supply of water of a given quality. Remember, when we're talking about water, we're talking about six things in water. We need to understand these six things. When we talk about water, we've got to talk about, it, about an assurance of supply. An assurance of supply under the current paradigm is guaranteed by the government. In the previous paradigm, the assurance of supply was given by the individual. So is the individual responsible or is the government responsible? That's an important conversation. Now, when we talk about assurance of supply, assurance is a guarantee of a given volume of water, of a given quality of water, at a given pressure, at a given price, at a given time, and a given place. So you must know, for example, if you're running a hospital, you need a high assurance of supply, high quality, high pressure, all those things. Now, when we start reaching the end of this paradigm of scarcity and we can now no longer ha have any more water to chase, you can't build another dam. This is the, you, we have sucked the rivers dry. Uh, we are now putting our sewage into the oceans and we're now polluting the oceans that way. We now have to do things differently. So how do we do things differently? Well, the first thing that we start seeing now is that the assurance of supply becomes broken. So we can no longer guarantee that every day you will have water of the same pressure. Every day you'll have water of the same quality. We can't guarantee that anymore. So once that starts happening now, we suddenly start getting into a different conversation. And can I just interrupt you here? As you unpack all of this doom and gloom, mm. I'm thinking about Cape Town. As a city, can it become crippled if we don't get our house in order as far as the water situation is concerned? I have this incredible burden on my shoulders that uh, when I talk about people talk about doom and gloom, I'm not a doomy, doomy and gloomy kind of guy. I'm actually a happy guy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an optimistic guy. And um, I'm, I'm optimistic about talking about this paradigm of abundance because that's really what I want to talk about. That's the future. The paradigm of scarcity is, I'm afraid, a, a crash and burn scenario. We cannot build any more dams in the Western Cape. There are no more. You talk about paradigm of abundance, yes. but we're not going to get there if we don't get the rains. It's been the worst drought in 100 years is what they say, is what the experts are telling us. Yes. Okay, hold that thought. Let's go for an ad break. We'll come back and unpack okay. all of that. Professor Anthony Turton, as you can hear, we're having an absolutely robust conversation around the issue, uh, the issue of water, scarcity, abundance, not only a worry for the people in the Western Cape, but globally. So do stay with us. Dr. Anthony, Professor Anthony Turnton is my guest in studio this morning. We're talking about the water crisis, not only in South Africa, but all around the world. We've had a similar conversation last year sometime, but it seems that the situation is becoming rather dire, and he is an environmentalist. He is steeped, his history is steeped in issues around water. He was also commissioned to participate in the fourth BRICS academic forum. Um, he's written a whole host of scientific uh, publications around the environment and water, water scarcity or water abundance. And he also specializes in water resource management and so much more. Like I said, his CV goes on for pages and pages and pages. So let's see how much we can cover with him this morning on the show. Mm -hmm. Let's pick up on water scarcity and abundance. And the issue around the drought. Yes. So we have built our, our, our modern economy on the Industrial Revolution over the last 150 years based on a fiction. And that fiction is now being challenged. Ooh. So we based it on a fiction that water is a finite resource. 
but it's not. Water is an infinite resource. Water is an infinitely renewable resource. And once we get that simple fact in our mind, a simple eloquent truth suddenly opens up your mind to a whole lot of new things. So let's just say that in the last 150 years, our, our global economy has been built on, on burning fossil fuel to, 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 to boil water into steam, to generate electricity, to then do other things. That's our global economic model. And, and within that, we've considered water to be a scarce resource. Uh, we even see statements to the effect that water is scarce, water is, fi is finite, water is vulnerable, etc. That's all the paradigm of scarcity. But it's built on this fiction. Water is not a scarce resource. Water is an infinitely renewable resource. The volume of water we have on planet Earth today is the same volume that we had millions and millions of years ago. So water, uh, uh, by virtue of the fact that water is, is an infinitely renewable resource, our problem is not water. Our problem is other stuff in water. So for example, of the total volume of water on planet Earth, only just over 2% is fresh water. So we have a salt problem, we have a pollution problem, not a water problem. So we know we have a huge pollution pr problem. We also talk about the plastic in the seas yes. and the plastic whale, etc. all of yes. that. We know and that's okay. for another okay. discussion. That's another conversation. So, but in terms of when we talk, take pollution out of the equation as well, what about desalinization? Now we get into the desalination conversation. And also this whole, it sounds like futuristic scientific um, fiction, but they also talk about uh, we what's it cloud seeding. seeding. Yes. Um, how does that work? Is that a possibility? Is it a solution to our problems? Yeah, okay. So all of those questions there we can now answer. Let's talk about desalination. If we understand that planet Earth, one third of planet Earth is land, two thirds is, is, water. is water. Is water. So our problem is not that we don't have water. Our problem is that we don't have water where we need it of the right quality. Ah. So we have salt water where we don't, we want fresh water. So the future of, of human beings as a species uh, is quite straightforward as far as I'm concerned. Unless we embrace science, engineering and technology on this new uh, uh, paradigm of abundance that's based on the now known physics and chemistry of water, that water is an infinitely renewable resource. It's not a scarce and finite resource. It is a renewable. The scarce and finite conversation sees water as a stock. The, the, the paradigm of abundance sees water as a flux. It moves in time and space. So the more times you use water in your economy, you can use water multiple times, each time doing something of value, but it's the same volume of water. You can have 100 liters of water here, cascaded around, generating electricity, coming out of electricity generation, now, now doing something else in the economy, then being used for, 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 for human consumption, then becoming sewage, then being recycled back for irrigation. You can use that same unit of water multiple times in the economy. So this is the new paradigm of abundance. And the paradigm of abundance is being pioneered in the Middle East, where, where people have reached the point now where your local uh, carbon-based economies are, are coming to the end of their life. The, uh, the, the oil industry is, is still going strong, but it's, but, it's, but it's in a state of decline over time. And ultimately, all of the capital that has been generated from oil revenues in the Middle East is now starting to go into brand new sort of next generation economies that are, that are, that are based on completely different uh, ideas to, to we, uh, to what we are, uh, are used to at the moment. So I would argue that in the Middle East, we're seeing, for example, massive desalination taking place. Massive, massive. And the more desalination and we And very have, successfully. Very successfully. And as it is improved, so the unit cost comes down. So that's the first thing. The second thing I'd like to say is that in the Western Cape, we are going to see a replication from the crisis in the Western Cape. We, we, we are going to interrogate the, 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 uh, the fragility of this paradigm of scarcity and we're going to see it for the fiction that it is. And we want everyone to interrogate that and everyone to understand that because we have to move mass opinion now into the new paradigm of abundance. And once we go to the new paradigm of abundance, we, we have a choice as a species. We are either going to go back to our deeply conservative roots, <laughs> okay, or we're going to, going to say, listen, we have to embrace modern technology. And this is a T-junction. Move with the times. This is a D-junction that we're mm -hmm. going to face as a species. So if we, if we, let's just say we turn right and not left, and we turn right and we say we're now going to embrace technology. 
Now with technology, well, we can now start desalinating seawater, but not only desalinating seawater, doing multiple things with water. So for example, it doesn't make sense to flush your toilet with, with, with drinking quality water. It doesn't make sense to, build, to make bricks to build your house with drinking quality water. But the argument then is that um, our systems, our sewage systems, etc., will not be able to handle um, the new ways in which uh, whatever it is that you use to flush your toilets. It's not geared to perhaps take chemical compounds to flush away all the effluent, etc. Okay, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. So let's deal with that question. At the moment, um, well, let's, just, let's accept that water can be used multiple times. But yeah. not necessarily for, for, for flushing, because for, for, as you're saying, that's... For fresh. various purposes, exactly. for various purposes. So, so let's, 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 let's coin a concept that we want people to talk about now. Let's talk about a dual stream reticulation economy. So an economy that is based on different streams of water, different qualities at different prices, available in different times ah. and different places. So now let's talk about the economic renewal that we need in our economy. Um, at, you mentioned now that we can't change our current sewage systems. Well, we have to change our current sewage systems. The good news is they're all old, they're all broken, and they have to be fixed anyhow. So when are we going to fix them? Instead of fixing them with the old technology, we're going to fix them with the latest technology. And the latest technology, this is going to create jobs. So we're now talking about uh, a rejuvenation of the economy on oh. the scale of the Marshall Plan that, 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 that came into post-World War II Europe where you had a massive amount of injection of capital and, 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 uh, and equipment to modernize, rapidly modernize those economies. And that's the success story of the European Union is based on that. So what is to stop us from putting our massive amounts of people that are unemployed into a new employment to dig up all the roads, because all the roads are broken anyhow, to, 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 to take all the broken pipes out of the ground, to, put, to lay new pipes. Now, instead of having one new pipe in every suburb or in every, in every wherever it is, or every city, uh, we now have three pipes. We've got a, we've got a, a clean water pipe pipe going in for human consumption and high quality water. We've got a grey water pipe going in that's safe water, but for, for use in gardens or for industrial processes. But then we've got our, 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 our sewage return flows that go back into the sewage processing plot. So every street has to have three pipes in it, as opposed to the two that they currently have. So you're talking massive uh, mind shift, massive planning and a huge injection of uh, money going yes. into this, uh, this whole new way of thinking and embracing this change and if we don't do it we're definitely going to die because people are talking about future wars being fought for territory um, water territory yes obviously um, so you are saying that it's possible people need to apply their minds government needs to get into partnership with the private sector to make this happen um, as far as desalination is concerned or renewable water what about cloud seeding okay so and, and look at costs as well because we've got to be realistic yes okay we'll talk about costs. let's talk about cloud seeding because this is raising its head all over the shop so if you're in the paradigm of scarcity what you're trying to do is squeeze the last drop out of the system. Absolutely. So, so, so it is a well-known technology where uh, within a cloud you get a, a process known as nucleation. And I believe it's happening yes. currently in South yeah, Africa. So, so you get nucleation and so, so you, get, you get the precipitation of a tiny, tiny particle of dust or a tiny particle of, of ice in the atmosphere. And once that happens, uh, you get a little nuclear f nucleus forming there now. You now start getting precipitation of water around that nucleus. So cloud seeding simply puts a nucleus out there. Uh, fine powder, fine powdery substance. They use uh, by a certain chemical. I can't remember what it's called now, but they they basically shoot it out through through rockets that are that are attached to uh, to aircraft. It's like a fighter wow. aircraft that goes up there, and they they shoot these things out there, and it's these tiny, fine little particles that now become the foundation of a cloud. You are now involved in geoengineering on a, on a large scale. Does it work? Yes, it does work. Costs. It, it, well, but there's a, there's a cost <laughs> involved. But you must remember, around every drop of water, you now you you're building it around a chemical mm -hmm. seed. So that stuff is going all over the show, that which, which, which you wouldn't have had before. And so yeah. you can do that. It's the same thing as where people say you can, you can capture water from the atmosphere by, by, by air water, where, where you know, at the bottom of your air conditioning plant, you always get water dripping out. Well, that's you condensing water on a, on a, on a compressor. Um, so so that's, that's another way. You, that's the paradigm of scarcity. You're getting the last drop out of the system. That's not the paradigm of abundance. The paradigm of abundance is we want to go into a better place where people are, 
are all employed, where, where people live a quality of life, where people can have a, a, a hope for a better future than they currently have. Because in the paradigm of scarcity, all we can hope for ultimately is survival. Okay, so you've, you've, you've put a lot on the table. Let's look at the issue around um, virtual water, green water and blue water. Yes. How does that fit into what you've unpacked now? Okay, so the, the, when we think about water, because water is, is found on planet Earth and to the best of our, our knowledge that's not found in any other planet that we know of in the universe at this moment in time. That's why NASA is looking for planets, Earth-like planets, uh, and they're looking for, for water in, in liquid, solid, and, 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 and vapor form. And because of that, water is involved in every conceivable thing that you can think of in planet Earth. Uh, we don't always think of it like that, but everything that you've got has got a, ver okay, has got a, a water content to it. So a colleague of mine, a, a professor of mine at the, univers at the University of, uh, of, of a School of Oriental African Studies, so as in the uh, University of London, uh, uh, Professor Tony Allen, very well known in the Middle East, um, North Africa area, he conceptualized the idea of virtual water. And, and he said that there's a, there's a certain volume of water in every commodity. And he interrogated this through the water wars lens. People were saying at that point in time that the wars in the next century will be fought over water. And then you got had Butras Butras Ghali that came out uh, and see, he said that it's li likely to happen in Egypt, in the Middle East. And this is where it's going to happen. And then, then, then Tony Allen said, but why hasn't it happened there? And he started looking at the flow of aid, particularly food, wheat from, 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 from North America. And he found that for every tonne of wheat, there's 10 tonnes of water. OK, and already they're talking, there's been issues around the, the Nile, the water of the Nile, yes. going down, uh, down yeah. uh, further south uh, in Africa. But let's talk about that after the air break. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> I could sit here all day talking to you. Professor Anthony Turton is my guest. He lectures in environmental studies at the University of the Free State. We're talking about the water crisis, not only in South Africa, but all around the world. And the good news is he's telling us uh, that it's not a crisis as much as the issue around abundance and scarcity. We just need to apply our minds, get a private sector and government on board, and who knows, we won't be having these conversations for much longer. But stay with us. Let's take an ad break. And we're talking about a very, very important uh, matter, commodity, resource, call it what you will. We're talking water, the scarcity of water and future wars being fought over um, territories, water territories, so to speak. Professor Anthony Turton is in studio talking to us about it, and he's somewhat of a guru as far as water resources is concerned. You will have gauged that by now, by all of the questions and all of the responses he's been giving us on the show this morning. Back to you, Professor, and you are a guru of sorts as far as the whole water issue is concerned. You've written many, many articles, publications, etc., mm. dealing with the issue of water, water scarcity, mm. abundance, um, rights over water, territory, wars, future wars mm. being fought over water. I think I, we, we, we spoke a little bit about Egypt and the Nile River. Mm. There were threats a little while ago about <clears throat> ownership of the water from the Nile. Yes. Okay, so if we go to the Nile River now, the, uh, <laughs> the issue there is where the White Nile and the Blue Nile comes together in Sudan and Khartoum. Um, the, the whole idea that Egypt has claimed sovereignty over the flow of the Nile, and this, this is based on their, on their traditional culture over thousands of years. Um, so this, what this does is this dooms your upstream riparian countries to perpetual poverty, which is in nobody's interest. So you're now seeing an assert of Ethiopia suddenly coming, coming to the fore. And with the partitioning of Sudan into North and South Sudan, uh, you're seeing some interesting uh, dynamics play out. So, so North Sudan is now aligned more to Egypt's interest, and South Sudan is now aligning itself more with upstream uh, uh, Ethiopian interests. And what Ethiopia is doing now is they're building this, this uh, Grand Renaissance Dam, 
of this, and that's going to be a hydropower dam. So there you're going to be seeing what I was saying early on now, where that same volume of water is going to be used repetitively throughout the Nile River Basin. Even though you are suggesting that the days of building of dams has come to an end, because we also know even though it comes with a lot of benefits, it also displaces a lot of people in the immediate uh, vicinity. Yes, so we're not going to see the, the end of the Damble era at one moment in time. You're going to see it tapering down. And, and I think you, you, you're going to see it certainly in South Africa. We don't have too many more places to build dams in South Africa. South Africa is amongst the top 20 countries in the world by virtue of the number of large dams we have. So yeah. we, are, we are up there with China and the United States you know, in terms of, of the number of large dams. And ironically, so is Zimbabwe. Believe it or not, South Africa and Zimbabwe are in the top 20 uh, um, out there. And that's this culture of scarcity where we've been trying to trap the last drop. So what's going to be happening in future now is we are going to embrace nature rather than fighting against nature. In man's arrogance, man became master and owner of nature by, by forcing rivers to go where they didn't want to go. Now we're increasingly going to see that we're going to start working with nature uh, out of respect for nature. And we're going to be working with the physics and chemistry of the, the, the notion that water is an infinitely renewable resource. And instead of storing water, because you have to store water, instead of storing it in the surface, on the surface in dams, where under conditions of climate change, you get massive amounts of losses to evaporation. Absolutely. You're now going to increasingly start seeing the storage of water underground in aquifers, in geological structures that are highly suited for this. So this is happening already in various parts of the world. Uh, I can give you some examples if you want, but uh, a, a classic example of it is in the city of Perth. And, and what's, what I like about the city of Perth is it's completely comparable to the city of Cape Town. Perth and Cape Town are, are both in winter rainfall areas. They're one of the six winter rainfall areas in the world. So they're unique in the sense that their rainfall it falls in winter, but they need to store water for summer when their crop production takes place. And the city of Perth, being the same climatic zone, there's 1.2 million people in Perth and there are 4 million people in Cape Town. So there's a scale difference there. Now the city of Perth, what they've done is they've made a decision that instead of discharging their sewage, into the ocean, which is what Cape Town currently does. They have started recovering their water from sewage through desalination technologies. And from 1.2 million people, they're recovering 120 million liters of water per day. So 1.2 million equals 120 megaliters per day. So that ratio is important. 1.2 million, 120 what megaliters. What happens to the effluent? Well, the, the effluent now, that, get, that gets processed and, and, get, and, get, and gets, gets dealt with in an appropriate way. But the water that gets recovered out of that now gets recycled back and stored in the ground in an aquifer. 120 meters below the ground, and it gets stored for, for a generation, for 25 years. But, but let's not apply those numbers. In Cape Town, they discharge all that water out to the ocean. And so we've now got to a point where the ocean is sick, the ocean is, uh, you know, the, all the oysters and all of the mussels are getting sick, the fish are being contaminated, people are, are, are unhappy about it. So 4 million people, using the same mathematics, you can recover potentially 400 megalitres per day. And the city of Cape Town right now can survive on 600 megalitres a day. So you can recover two-thirds of, 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 of Cape Town's current water needs just by, just by managing your sewage better. Okay, you You've got all the answers. I'm hoping and praying that you are in conversation with government and key private sector players to start getting these things off the ground. Because if it's not already happening, then we are doomed. These things should have been halfway there or nearly, yes. you know, we, we should have been at the end of all of this planning or implementation of all, all of these weird and wonderful ideas. Um. What I, I'm part, I'm part of, a, of an initiative, a private sector initiative, uh, whereby we are reaching out to the new president, uh, Ramaphosa, and we are asking the president to take water very seriously, and we are asking the president to look at water as, as a paradigm of abundance, as an enabler for economic growth and development. So that's, what we, that's our challenge to the president. And, and uh, if the president uh, chooses to go down that route, then I will very, very gladly give all my support in whatever way I possibly can. And of course, there's a huge amount of private sector initiative that's also there. The private sector brings two important things to this party. They bring capital because the government right now is bankrupt, they don't have enough money, but they also bring technology.
And what we've seen over this Cape Town crisis is that there's no scarcity of technology. There's an infinite number of technologies. There are thousands of potential technologies you can, you can you use. And there's also an infinite amount of capital. So when we get to the price of these things, people say, oh, but desalination is so expensive. So what is the alternative? So expensive compared to what? So at the moment, because we've said, oh, it's too expensive, we're not going to implement it. So now the economy crashes, so we've now got mass unemployment, and you're now going to have a recession. And you know, so what is the cost of that? So we've got to think of it in, 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 in that light. But certainly, uh, I'm doing a, a, a podcast like this in, on Thursday, in fact, where we are sending messages to the president exactly about what I'm talking about. All right. With uh, uh, a few minutes to go, you are very proud about your family roots and history. Tell us about that. I think it's absolutely fascinating that someone can actually trace their roots back <laughs> right to the 1500s. And you're connected to so many well-known <laughs> families in the country. Yes, um, uh, just in a, in a sort of headline level, um, because I am a 12th generation South African, um, I've got at, at least uh, 10,000 relatives that, oh that, that, that came before me, and we've uh, we've we've got enough data on a, on a, on 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 a, a representative enough a sample of that of, of over a thousand of those people we know a lot of detail about. So we can extrapolate up from that knowledge. And my my orange is very interesting because uh, um, my my oldest relative that came to the country was in fact a refugee escaping from religious intolerance of all things mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in the uh, what was called the Thirty Year War between uh, Protestants and uh, and and Catholics. Uh, in in, in, in Europe. Uh, so he came originally from a, a little village outside what is today Cologne on the Rhine River. And he was born into the Thirty Years War, fought as a soldier eventually in the Thirty Years War, was displaced as a refugee from the Thirty Year War, and then joined the Dutch East India Company to come to Cape Town uh, to establish the very, very first settlement. But there it gets interesting because there, my next generation uh, 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 settlers came from two sources. One of them was also um, people escaping from religious intolerance in Europe, the French Huguenots. So I've got a lot of French Huguenot blood in me. <laughs> and then, 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 interestingly enough, the Malay slaves that came over. Yes. So I've got some Malay blood in me, so therefore I've got some, 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 some Muslim blood in me. Okay? So you're an echte South Afrikaner. <laughs> I'm an echte South Afrikaner, and uh -huh. it's, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm a complete... Uh, 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 yeah, I, I, I embrace all of these things, and I try to respect them all, and I try to understand them all, and I try to sort of dignify them in my daily life. Okay, to wrap up on a positive note as regards the water situation in South Africa, particularly in the Western yes. uh, Cape, what's the situation like there right now as we speak? And let's talk about the light on the horizon. What will that be and how soon are we going to see that light on the horizon? I think the Western Cape situation is dire. I, I, I've used the analogy in speaking to the media that uh, think of the West, think of day zero as the, as the iceberg that has struck the Titanic. So the Titanic is now, we are in the Titanic, and, and, and after the iceberg or hit, or the Titanic hit the iceberg, the Titanic floated for a period of time. So we are at that moment where we, we've hit the iceberg, we're still afloat. We are going to sink, but we haven't sunk yet. That's the important analogy. Another analogy would be that we are in, in an airplane and we're coming down to earth and something has gone wrong, so we're going to have a bumpy landing. So our first short-term objective is to limit the negative impact. So we want to reduce the number of casualties and we want to keep it down to a manageable level, but there will be casualties of, of that. I've got very, very little doubt. I'm going to another meeting after this now to, you know, with people, with clients, just to map that whole thing out. So that's going to happen. So it's going to be a, be a bad news story in the short term. In the short term. In the short term. The but, emphasis being short term. Yes, but in the long term now, we're seeing an enormous amount of resilience coming out of Cape Town. We're seeing that people are digging deep. People are, are working as communities like never before. And, and, and there, there's some many, many positive ideas coming out of the city of Cape Town. And this I think we should follow, we should laud, we should, we should nurture and support. But coming out of Cape Town, I think ultimately is going to be, this will be the crucible. The, the Cape Town will become the Middle East example now of how to make a resilience city. 
And so, so Cape Town will truly be a resilient city. What people might not remember was that the mayor of Cape Town some years ago, Helen Zilla, was voted one of the, the, the top mayor of, uh, 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 of 800 cities in the world. So Cape Town is a world-class city. It's now in, in a bad place, but it's once again going to emerge, I believe, as the, as the, as the prime example of a city that has gone through a crisis, completely adapted and rejigged and rethought it through, and ultimately now becomes the beacon of hope for this new paradigm of abundance going forward. And as they say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So no doubt we're going to emerge as South Africans and Cape Townians. We are going to truly emerge stronger. It is truly the beginning of a new dawn, is it not? Yes, it is. And in fact, within the Cape Town thing, I want to just give you some cultural context, OK? Um, Very quickly, we've the, almost run out of time. The, 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 the Hamisa system, the, the, the Hamisa River system, which is where the first uh, development to happen in, 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 in Cape Town, is also the, the origin of Islam in South Africa. The first Malay slaves came there, and, and all settled. of your oldest, your oldest Islamic roots can be traced back to that place. So you get a complete overlap there, and this is something that I think is going to start emerging as well. Wow. The next time you come in, we're going to talk more about the history of the Cape Malays or the Cape settlements, inshallah. Lovely talking to you. Thank you for coming in and giving wow. us hope. Thank you for sharing the issue around scarcity and abundance. It truly makes us realize we need to wake up, we need to embrace new technologies, and we will be saved. So thank you so much. Continue your amazing work. Professor Anthony Turton, uh, it was absolutely amazing talking to him. Fascinating man, fascinating ideas, and truly leaving us with a ray of hope. Thank you for being with us on the show this morning. Loved every minute of it. Till the next time, as always, it is Khodafes from me. Julie Ali. Yeah, hello, yeah.